Hello, I am Dr. Satish Agarwal and I am currently the Chairman of Pediatric Surgery at Sir Gangaram Hospital in New Delhi. Prior to that, I was a Director Professor and Head of the Department of Pediatric Surgery at uh, Maulana Azad Medical College in New Delhi. And today, I'll be speaking on a very important topic uh, for general surgeons, uh, DNB students, MS students, practicing surgeons, as well as uh, <clears throat> the aspiring pediatric surgeons. The topic for today is pelvic ureteric junction or PUJ obstruction, which I'll be taking in two parts. One is the clinical part and the second is operative part. Now, looking back at the urinary tract, comprising of the kidney, which has its cortex, the solid portion, the pelvis, the collecting bag of the kidney, and then the PU junction or the pelvic ureteric junction, and the VU junction or vesico ureteric junction. And lower down, you have the posterior urethra and a very important condition where an obstruction of congenital nature can occur is at the posterior urethra called as PU valves, posterior urethral valves. So these three entities, PUJ, VUJ, and PUV, they comprise almost more than 90% of congenital obstructions in the urinary tract. Now it's important to understand that if <clears throat> the obstruction is at the pelvic ureteric junction, then all the aftermath of back pressure will fall on the kidney and the pelvis, pelvis and the kidney. And once the pelvis distends and is full, then the pressure gets transmitted to the calyces, which are normally in the shape of cups like this, sharp edges. But gradually they get effaced out and they get into a kind of a bulbous dilatation of the pelvis like this. Rather than like this, they become like this. And as it happens, the kidney cortex, the cortex of the kidney gets compressed and that is what leads to loss of function in the kidney because of a pelvic ureteric junction obstruction. Now, as the logic dictates, if the obstruction is there at the pelvic ureteric junction, then the entire brunt will come on the kidney and the pelvis. The lower systems, the lower systems will be quite normal. And of course, the other side will be normal. And this is the classical scenario of a unilateral, isolated, pelvic ureteric junction obstruction. We'll discuss some scenarios where there can be concomitant obstruction at PUJ and VUJ, but that's not the routine. So this is typically what is PUJ obstruction. So this is the kidney which has been exposed. You can see this pinkish cortex of the kidney. And this is the dilated pelvis. And the stay suture has been taken at the pelvic ureteric junction. Here. And the kidney has been exposed by an anterior extraperitoneal approach. This is the left side. So the kidney is here, pelvis is there, pelvic ureteric junction is there, pelvis is dilated, and you can see some surface vascularity on the pelvis. Now, what happens when you decompress this kidney? When you decompress, you can see that the kidney is collapsing just like a heap of tissue. This is the divided pelvic ureteric junction. So, from this state, where the kidney was distended, the kidney gets collapsed once you decompress. And this is a classical example of a PUJ obstruction, which has resulted in loss of cortical thickness and 
severe hydronephrosis. I'll start with an illustrative case and then we'll get on to discuss different clinical aspects of PUJ obstruction. So this child who is four weeks old currently has had antenatally detected right-sided hydronephrosis detected first at the 23rd week of gestation and thereafter progressive in subsequent scans. There was no oligohydramnios. He was born normal, was asymptomatic. At four weeks, another ultrasound was repeated, which showed the right pelvis to be of the size of 40 millimeters with a little bit dilatation of the upper ureter. Now this is the catch here in this case. Just keep, just remember, upper ureter was mildly dilated on the ultrasound. So go back to this scenario. PUJ should not have ureteric dilatation. The ureter should be normal. So in this light, remember this detail in this child. So upper ureter was mildly dilated. He had a palpable right kidney on clinical examination. On investigation, the kidney was functioning at 20% rather than 50% on a renal dynamic scan. We'll explain what a renal dynamic scan is. And the dynamic scan also showed an obstructive curve. So the diagnosis of pelvic ureteric junction obstruction was quite obvious. However, the upper ureter was mildly dilated. So we planned to do a cystoscopy, a retrograde pyelography, and then proceed for pyeloplasty or whatever uh, is required. So this is the cystoscopy on this child. Now, you can see the, both the ureteric orifices are there, but there is another mound-like structure in the middle, which could be an ectopic opening of a ureter, or it could just be an impression of uh, some soft tissue there. That's the bladder neck. So there was a suspicion that this is a duplex system because there are two ureteric orifices on the right side. And then we cannulated the lateral orifice on the right side, and this is the ureteric catheter into this ureteric orifice. And when we did a retrograde pilogram, you can see here that this ureter is lower ureter, then there is dilatation, then there is a block, and then the pelvis is distended, calluses are distended, as shown here. So this is a dual obstruction, obstruction at the pelvic ureteric junction and obstruction at the upper ureter level with in between dilatation. And this is important and we'll illustrate this. So this child had a pyeloplasty and a nephropexy. So this illustration uh, tells you about several aspects of pelvic ureteric junction obstruction. This is relatively an advanced case, but I chose this to, to apprise you right at the beginning that you can have a wide spectrum of problems when you're dealing with unilateral hydronephrosis because of pelvic ureteric junction obstruction. So what we did, so this is first of all the uh, depiction of the anatomy. And this is a, a drawing taken from the real operative notes of this child. So always develop this habit of recording your findings in pictorial form, in sketch diagrams, and, and, and show what operation you have done. So this was a dilated extrarenal pelvis, then a narrow upper ureter, then dilated ureter, and then normal ureter below the stricture on the ureter at this level, so dual obstruction. Now the implication of this kind of finding is that you must excise all the obstruction from here to here to get a good result. And so this shows that all this has been excised from here to here 
and the lower ureter which was normal has been spatulated laterally to make a wider anastomosis. So this spatulation on the lateral aspect of ureter is important. And then the pelvis has been opened there and a wide anastomosis with a double J stent. Now you can imagine that if you have to excise this much segment, if you have to excise a large segment, say if you have to excise this much segment, the lower ureter is here which you have spatulated, the pelvis will be here. So from here to here, how will you bridge the gap? Because you had to excise a long segment. And to tackle this situation, what you need to do is you need to bring the kidney down. Like in this diagram, the adrenal has been left behind and the kidney has been shifted down. Not only that, in case the kidney is very floppy, it just collapses into a heap of tissue, doesn't maintain its shape, then the lower pole of the kidney may have to be shifted laterally. So kidney may need to be brought downwards and taken laterally on the lower pole so that the anastomosis opens up like a funnel, like a funnel. If the, if the lower pole was lying here, then the lower pole itself could cause obstruction at this anastomosis. So if you shift the lower pole laterally, then the anastomosis opens up like a funnel and becomes unobstructed. So this is uh, an illustration of a difficult case of PUJ obstruction where you have to excise all the disease segment of the ureter. You have to get the anastomosis without too much tension and for that you have to bridge the gap by shifting the kidney down and by rotating the lower pole laterally in order to achieve a good anastomosis. So now coming on the epidemiology of PUJ obstruction. Uh, some of these things are important to remember because you might get a question out of it. So remember the incidence, male and female almost have an equal incidence. Left side is slightly more common than the right. It's generally sporadic, but autosomal dominant familial inheritance has also been reported. Now, if other renal anomalies are there, for example, if there is MCDK on one side, MCDK or multicystic dysplastic kidney on one side may have 20% incidence of renal obstructive malformations on the contralateral side. Or if the child has other anomalies of vectoral association, vertebral, anorectal, cardiac, tracheoesophageal, radial, renal, and limb anomalies. 